My name is Jim Walker. Um, if you have any trouble uh, hearing me, please uh, just wave your hand uh, around and I'll move a little closer to the mic. I want to welcome you to this year's Law Day reception and art contest. We're happy to have you here with us today. I am a trustee for the Rupert J. Smith Law Library and president of the Friends of the RJS Law Library, a 501c3 support group which promotes awareness of the Law Library and the scope of its resources. Um, we're here today to honor a number of people and then we'll be moving on to the art contest. The ultimate beneficiary of today's proceeding is the law as we recognize, celebrate, and honor the rule of law in our community as well as the highest ideals of the law, including the headwaters principle that the law provides justice equally for all. And we are well aware that that principle cannot be applied unless all have equal access to the law. And that's where the Rupert J. Smith Law Library comes in. The Law Library is located at 221 South Indian River Drive. And for our students here, I hope that you will never hesitate to come down to the Law Library when you have a law-oriented paper that you need to, uh, to do you want some assistance in researching legal resources, the law librarians will just be delighted to have you. And I want to emphasize that because when I was your age, the thought of going into a, a law library <clears throat> made me think that if I did, I'd be arrested. So I want you to know, every, the law library is accessible to the general public just as it is to the uh, lawyers of our community. Um, having done that, it's important that we recognize the sponsors, those whose contributions made this uh, event here this evening possible. Very important that we do recognize them. I'd like to thank the St. Lucie County Bar Association for its help. Every year, the Bar Association comes through with a very significant endowment. Jeff Rollins is the president this year. Jeff, thank you very much on behalf of uh, Friends of the RJS Law Library. <laughs> TD Bank worth recognizing. We certainly want to offer them our warmest gratitude for the grant that TD Bank gave to us this year. TD Bank is um, the one of the 10th largest banks in the country. They have over 26,000 employees and yet as evidenced perhaps by their support of this evening's assembly, they are a very community-oriented bank, and we are so very grateful to TD Bank for its assistance. We have here with us, who is also a member of the Board of Directors for Friends, Renee Ortega, who is the branch manager of TD Bank out on Okeechobee. Thank you, sir, very much. There is Searcy, Denny, Scarola, Barnhart, and Shipley. That's a West Palm Beach firm. They do plaintiffs' personal injury. They have a well-regarded reputation that they have earned through excellent service on behalf of plaintiff litigants. Uh, they have a, a good reputation. Uh, I know uh, I'm privileged to know Christian Searcy personally. Uh, is there anybody here from uh, Searcy Denny this evening? Well, we certainly want to acknowledge that firm and thank them for what they've done on our behalf. Everloving Associates, 
Nor Everlove has been our librarian for 20 some years, I think. Uh, Judge Burton Connor knows her well. She took our law library under the wing and it's the only public library that she is affiliated with, but we can thank her for having made the law library what it is. Everlove and Associates is one of the largest law library service companies in the country. They have uh, their Florida base, they have clients all over the state. Uh, again, uh, we're the only public library that they work with and we're so very fortunate to be the beneficiaries of that involvement. Florida Rural Legal Services. We are so very grateful to FRLS for their assistance and involvement in our behalf. Uh, I asked Karen, Carolyn Fabrizio, who is with FRLS, to give me some material on this. She was kind enough to oblige me. Let me just briefly read out the description. Florida Rural Legal Services is a nonprofit law firm dedicated to providing quality legal, civil advice, representation, and education for low income people and communities. FRLS strives to be a relevant force in the lives of its client, utilizing all forms and strategies available to legal advocacy within the limits imposed by law. It uh, helps low income clients with issues and problems in the areas of civil rights, consumer law, employment law, family, foreclosure, economic stability, housing, public benefits, elder law, and farm worker law. So if you or anyone that you know of feels there's a chance that you've got a problem and you may qualify on income grounds and you fall within one of those broad areas, I would encourage you to get with FRLS and see what they can do to be of assistance. They're a wonderful group of people. Carolyn, I want to thank you on behalf of Friends for the support of your fine organization. There is also the firm of Gordon and Donner. That too is a plaintiff's law firm uh, in uh, West Palm Beach. Um, they have 15 attorneys. They're a very large firm. Uh, the material that they post has this uh, description. I'd like to just briefly read this out to you. Headquartered in Palm Beach Gardens, uh, we also have offices located throughout Palm Beach, Martin, and Broward counties. Our team of experienced personal injury attorneys and knowledgeable staff bring the highest level of professionalism and personal attention to every case that they represent. They're a fine firm. We are privileged to be affiliated with them through their sponsorship. Josh? Josh? Uh, Josh is an attorney with that firm and we want to thank him very much. Jason Berger. Jason Berger is uh, an attorney in uh, Mark County. He started out as an assistant state attorney he uh, practices in the area of family law, personal injury, and estate planning. Um, Jason, uh, are you, is Jason here? <clears throat> Jason is a fine lawyer and we're happy to have his support and we're, uh, we're grateful if we, uh, if we are able to draw on the support of lawyers such as Mr. Berger and these firms, we have no fear about the continued success of the RJS Law Library in the Treasure Coast area. Then there is Kim Kunzo. Like Mr. Berger, she started out as an assistant state's attorney. 
And then she went into private practice here in downtown Fort Pierce. And she specializes in family law, and there are a number of aspects that she is highly proficient in, including child support, custody, visitation, time sharing and parental plans, modifications, and temporary relief. She is an outstanding family law attorney, and we are just delighted and so very grateful for uh, her assistance. Kim? Kim, where are you? Thank you very much. And again, we want to thank all of these wonderful people and organizations for their support of the Rupert J. Smith Law Library and Law Week. <clears throat> We will now be commencing this event with the Pledge of Allegiance. This is led by the Honorable Burton Connor, and it is his want every year to talk about the pledge a little bit before he leads it so that people understand what that's about and realize that it's not merely a formula that we uh, uh, offer by rote when we face the flag and we put our hands over our chest. We are fortunate to have Judge Connor here to attend to this very important task. I'd like to tell you a little bit about him because after this he is also going to be introducing our keynote speaker. So I'd like you to have some idea of his background. Judge Connor, I'm proud to say, is a personal friend of mine. He sat on the board of directors for the RJS Law Library for, it's got to have been a good 10 years, uh, and we worked together in that capacity. But he is a graduate of Duke University, the Harvard of the South, they call it. After he went to Duke, he went to the University of Florida where he got his JD degree. He then went into practice with the firm of Conley and Conley in Okeechobee from 1979 to 1984. After that, he became a county judge there in Okeechobee for about uh, four years before once again, returning to private practice in a solo practice for about seven years. Before, in 1997, he became a circuit court judge where he served on the bench until 2011. After 2011, he was appointed to the Fourth District Court of Appeal down in West Palm Beach. And for you younger folks who may be wondering what a district court is, that is just below the Florida Supreme Court. That's a very important court. When the local judges make a ruling and someone wants to appeal, they go down to West Palm Beach to the district court there. And it is judges like the Honorable Burton Connor who hear their case. So uh, with that, uh, we will again thank the Honorable Burton Connor and turn the podium over to him. Sir. Mr. Walker, thank you very much. Um, as Mr. Walker mentioned, uh, this is Law Week, and it's the week where across the country we give honor to lawyers in our legal system. And I do think it's important to uh, think a little bit about the Pledge of Allegiance, and I want to share with you two observations. The first one is, the Pledge of Allegiance is a very simple way that we Americans can express our appreciation to the men and women in the military who over the course of our history have died, suffered injury, or sacrificed being with their families and friends in order to protect this great nation. And let us not forget, ladies and gentlemen, that as we sit in the comfort of this room tonight, 
there are men and women in the military putting their lives on the line trying to protect this republic. And as great as our military system is, it's not what makes us the greatest country of all times. I would submit to you that it's our system of justice. And it's the three great pillars upon which it rests. The rule of law, a strong and independent judiciary, and the right to a trial by jury. And the right to a trial by jury is so incredibly important because think about it. I, I know some of you adults are getting those jury summons and hopefully some of you younger people will be getting them in the future. And when you get that jury summons, please don't try to get out of it because think about it. In our system of government, and it's the only country in the world that grants the right to a trial by jury in as many cases as we do, we ask everyday citizens to come in and basically be citizen judges. The judge wearing the black robe will give you the instructions of law that you're supposed to follow, but what we ask the jury to do is to take those words and decide what do these words mean and how do they apply to a set of facts? And if you think about that, ladies and gentlemen, the fact that our government puts that kind of trust into everyday citizens, I defy anyone to come up with a more fair and just system. All the words to the pledge are the most important. All the words to the pledge are important, but I would submit to you it's the last three words that are the most important. Justice for all. Because without justice for all, you can never have liberty for all. We live in the greatest republic of all time. We have the freedom of speech. So if you would care to do so, if you would please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Mr. Walker sent me an email this morning uh, explaining that unfortunately um, Judge Schwab who was slated, you'll see on the program, to introduced the keynote speaker, unfortunately had a family emergency, was not able to be here this evening, so he asked me if I would make the introduction, and I said, yes, uh, the only problem is, unfortunately, I don't know much about Judge McNicholas, because when I was here as a trial judge, unfortunately, our paths never really crossed, so Mr. Walker was kind enough to send me a little bit of bio information, and um, I discovered that uh, Judge McNicholas and I share some things in common. For example, um, we both grew up in large families. He was the fifth, we were both middle children. He was the fifth out of eight. Um, we both knew by first grade that we wanted to be lawyers. We were the first in our families to be a lawyer. And we both worked construction in college before going to law school. Um, Judge McNicholas is a Florida native. He grew up in South Florida, and as I mentioned, he was the fifth of eight children. He attended the University of Florida uh, as a, a, uh, for college, and then he graduated with honors from the Stetson uh, University College of Law. He served, as you've heard many people this evening, as an assistant state attorney here in the 19th Circuit under Mr. Colton, who you'll hear from in a little bit. Uh, he also, um, however, worked in private practice, both for a prominent local law firm and his own practice. He served for several years as general counsel for Sun Trust of the Treasure Coast. And before being elected as a circuit judge, he also served in the 19th Circuit. And for the, those who may not be familiar, the 19th Circuit is four counties. It's St. Lucie, Any River, Okeechobee, and Martin County. Uh, but before being elected as a circuit judge, he also served as a certified mediator and also a certified traffic hearing officer here in the 19th Circuit. He's married with three teenage boys. Uh, he served on a number of local nonprofit boards. And last November, he was elected as a circuit judge and he's been serving in that capacity since January. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Judge Michael McNicholas.
What's everybody looking at? <laughs> Well, shortly after I, I won the election, uh, Mr. Walker called me up and asked if I would uh, do him the favor of being a keynote speaker for this event. And I was so excited because I've never been a keynote speaker in my life. So uh, I was advised that I have no less than 45 minutes to talk about the 14th Amendment. So if you've got your refreshments, that'd be good. And we'll go from there. Uh, I do appreciate, I, I am honored to have been elected circuit court judge, uh, serving you uh, currently in Martin County in the Family Law uh, District. Um, and I thank Mr. Walker and the board of the Friends of uh, the Rupert Smith Library for uh, having me here tonight. When I, I, I do a lot of uh, constitutional teachings in the, in the elementary schools and the middle schools, my wife's a school teacher, so I think it's important to, to get with the kids and explain to them more why we have these things. So a lot of the times I focus on the Bill of Rights. And I talk to the kids, and I want you kids to listen up because I'm really talking to you. The parents already know what's going on. But I, I, I talk to them about why, what happened when we had the King of England running our world. Um, things were good for a while, but then he started taking advantage and things were taken from us and we were taxed and overburdened. And the colonists, the 13 colonies, decided we're going to get rid of the king because we don't like the king. And after we got rid of the king after the Revolutionary War, we knew that we needed a central government. But we did not want a, another king. So we prepared a constitution and we limited the federal government but with 10 amendments. Does anybody know what those 10 amendments are called? The Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights start out with the, uh, the First Amendment. Starts out with Congress shall pass no law. That gives you a key of the purpose of the, of the uh, Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights are to limit the federal government from imposing its will upon the states so that the states have autonomy over their individual states, except for those powers that they give to the federal government. When we did the Constitution, we still had the problem of slavery, and we couldn't solve that problem during the Constitution. But ultimately, uh, 100 years after, or close to 100 years after the Constitution, the colonies decided to to decide how they're going to do or deal with slavery, and that ended up being with the Civil War. The problem that the congressmen who wanted to abolish slavery was once they became, once they won and, and slavery was abolished, what were the slaves, what were going to come by the slaves? The slaves were not citizens under any measure, the, mostly the because the federal government could not grant uh, the state or could not grant the citizenship to the states. Only the states could grant those, and the states treated the slaves as property. So once they were freed, they were basically freemen, but they weren't citizens of the the states. So the Thirteenth Amendment. There were three amendments in the Reconstruction era, which is the Civil War. Uh, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. But that didn't solve the problem. So the congressmen came up uh, with the idea that they're going to grant the, uh, they're going to, to uh, um, they're going to enact the Civil Rights Act of 1866. And that, because, I, I gotta back up here, so they won the war, uh, and we have 10 colonies that are no longer part of the Union. They're kind of governed by the, federal, uh, by the federal government, by the Union Army or the Union government. So they need to reconstruct these 10 Confederate uh, settlements. And reconstruct doesn't mean build up the new homes. It means to reconstruct their thinking and reconstruct their, their constitutions to bring them more in line with what the Union uh, wanted. With that in mind, the states started enacting what's known as 
black code or black laws, which basically, even though the 13th Amendment abolished slavery, the black laws pretty much effectively maintained those because they limited the slaves or the freemen from entering into contracts, uh, doing certain employment jobs, or not being able to leave employment without get, getting permission from their employers. So the Congress decided they're going to enact this Civil Rights Act of 1866. And that starts out with saying that all persons born in the U.S are declared citizens of the United States. So now the freemen, or any aliens, who are born in or on the soil of the United States were now going to be deemed citizens of the United States. And then they were going to be able to enjoy the rights of all the whites, uh, the white citizens. The problem with that is now we're going to reintegrate the Confederate States into the Union. And once that happens, the Union, or the, the Confederate States, will be able to uh, grasp control of the Congress and get rid of this federal statute. That is why we have the 14th Amendment. The Republican, or the radical Republicans, who wanted to ensure that in any event that all people were going to be treated the same, decided that they're going to have, that they needed to get an actual amendment to the Constitution. And that is the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. And that starts out stating that all poor persons born or naturalized in the United States are going to both be national citizens as well as citizens of the states in which they exist. The next segment of that starts off with, no state shall make or enforce any law. So guess what they just did? We start out with the, ten, with the Bill of Rights that said, Congress shall make no law. So we're limiting the federal government from administering laws that are going to take away our unalienable rights. And now the federal government, through the 14th uh, Amendment, is now restricting the state governments from enacting laws or treating people fairly. So basically, the radical Republicans at the time incorporated the Bill of Rights to now affect the state governments to ensure that all people within the state boundaries are going to be treated fairly with due process and with uh, equal administration of the law. It's important, I think, to understand the history of these laws so that you see why they exist. The 14th Amendment is probably one of the most uh, complex and litigated amendment in, in the entire Constitution, and it, it continues to transform democracy, which is what the theme of this is. Today, we have the immigration laws that are being enacted, um, which bring up uh, the 14th Amendment uh, concerns under uh, the Equal Rights Clause. Um, so in order to go into the uh, Equal Protection Clause, uh, they have semester courses on this. But uh, as long as you understand where, you're, where it comes from, I hope that taught you a little bit. I don't want to take any more of your time. And uh, I appreciate again for you all having me here. Thank you. Judge McNichols, uh, uh, Nicholas, we want to thank you for helping us out. Uh, I'm going to present a book, but with your permission, I'm not going to take it out of its wrapper. This is a rare first edition of The Spirit of the Common Law by Roscoe Pound. In 1921, uh, Roscoe Pound, who was one of the country's foremost legal scholars and who was a, uh, the dean of the Harvard Law School for 20 years, did a, a brilliant series of lectures at Dartmouth College and in 1922 
Those were embodied in the first printed edition of, of those lectures entitled The Spirit of the Common Law. So it's with pleasure and gratitude, sir, that we present this to you with our thanks. Well, I thank you all, and I wish you all the best. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. We're now going to be turning to our honorees. The first honoree of the evening will be presented through Bruce Colton. Mr. Colton has helped us with these matters before. Let me tell you a little bit about Mr. Colton before he actually comes up to the podium, <laughs> however. Mr. Colton uh, received his BA from Ohio University. Like uh, Judge Connor, he's a Gator. He got his uh, JD at the University of Florida in 1972. From 1972 to 1974, he was an assistant public, def uh, uh, public defender, yes, and then he switched and went to the state attorney's office in 1974 where he remained as an assistant city attorney until 1985, rising to the rank there of the chief assistant state's attorney. In 1985, he became the state's attorney for the 19th Judicial Circuit, and he has thus served there from the present, uh, from 1985 to the present, a period of 32 years, a very distinguished career on behalf of the people of the state of Florida. We're happy to have him here. The respect in which he is universally held, I think, is exemplified by the fact that he is currently the president of the Florida Prosecuting Attorneys Association. We're very happy to have Mr. Colton here with us this evening to recognize the honoree in question. Thank you. Thank you. The, the person who I'm uh, about to talk about, who is one of the two people who are being awarded tonight, is Lane Fry. Uh, Lane is not here with us tonight, and I hate to put a damper on things. Lane passed away about a little over a week ago. She, was, she fought an illness that she found out she had last fall and fought it valiantly. And, uh, but I wanted, she did pass away, but before she did, Carlos Wells, who's part of this committee, called Lane and let her know that she was going to be receiving this award. And while she thanked him very much for the award, she made it absolutely clear to Carlos that the people who really deserve it are the people that she worked with every day at the state attorney's office. So I'm not gonna talk for a long time, but I wanna tell you a little bit about Lane, what it was that she did. First, let me tell you, the state attorney's office is responsible for prosecuting crimes that occur within our four county area. When a person gets arrested, when they have to go to court uh, for a trial, for their case to be heard, it's the state attorney's office that uh, represents the state in those cases. And in most cases where there's a crime, there's a victim. And we have within our office a victim services division. It's made up of a combination of paid professional victim advocates as well as a core of volunteers who work with them. And what they do is when a person's a victim of a crime and the case comes to our office, a victim advocate is assigned and gets together with the victims, keeps them informed of what's going on, helps them with any problems they have, whether if they've been injured, they help them not only get medical help, but take care of insurance claims and so forth. If they've lost property or had damage to their property, they help them with that. If people need psychological counseling, they help them get that. When they have to go to court, they go with them. They're with them throughout the entire process, which sometimes can go on for not only months, but even years. And these are the people who are dedicated to working with these victims of crimes. Lane, since uh, 2014, ran that program in the four-county area. The program 
actually started in, in, uh, in the early 80s. Lane started with our office in 1997. She was in her 20th year with our office. Uh, she was a graduate of Indian River State College where she, she received her bachelor's degree. Uh, she worked primarily in the beginning in Indian River County, but then ended up supervising all four counties. Um, Lane is a person who never wanted to take credit for the things that she did, but always turned to the people that she worked with to give them credit. So I think it's, it's not only a great honor that she got this award, it's very fitting. And as, as Carlos told me, this wasn't just something that they decided to give her because they knew that she was sick or that she didn't have a long time with us. When Carlos uh, told me that he nominated her for this award, it was based on the work that he knew that she had done and he didn't even know uh, about her illness at the time that he did that, which I think makes it even more, even more meaningful. Elaine's son, TJ, is here with us tonight and I appreciate your being able to come tonight. Uh, I'm not going to accept the award for Elaine, but I would ask that uh, Tracy Amandro and Julie Stoika come up and, act, and actually receive the award for Elaine. And on behalf of Lane Fry and the Victim Assistance Program, we really appreciate it. For our second honoree this evening, we're privileged to have the presentation made by Diamond Liddy, who is the public defender here in the 19th Judicial Circuit. Diamond Liddy is a 1978 graduate of Rollins College. She graduated from the Nova Law School. <clears throat> like so many others here, she started out with the uh, State Attorney's Office. She was there from 1981 to 1987. She went into private practice, specializing in family law and criminal law. From 1992 to the present, she has served our community as the public defender. She is a member and the secretary of the of Florida's Justice Administrative Commission, which serves uh, all of the circuits here in uh, the state, uh, both the state attorney's office and the public defender's office. Uh, I would give you a listing of her uh, community organizations that she has been involved with, but please understand, it, it, it'd be like that. Uh, <laughs> We, we just would not have time this evening to itemize the things that she has done and the good that she has done on behalf of the Treasure Coast. We are just so lucky to have her as our public defender and are exceedingly grateful for her involvement in making this presentation. Thank you, Diamond. Uh, before I uh, introduce our next honoree, I, I just want you to know, now Bruce and I have both been in our positions for a long time. Now Bruce is much older than I, and he's been doing it for a much longer period. Um, but we often give speeches together, so it's really hard for me not to break into the what the public defender's office does and talk about our, because he's in the room. But the thing that really irritates me about Bruce is he, he got up here. Now, he gets up here, gives the um, introduction without a note, 
as smooth as silk, just bam. Now, I want you to know <laughs> every word I'm going to tell you tonight and talk to you about is written down. And this is the fourth draft. <laughs> and my, my goal in life <laughs> is to be as smooth as Bruce Colton. So just say. <clears throat> Okay, when Jim, no, when, when Jim approached me about uh, nominating somebody for this award, um, I told him I knew exactly who to nominate, and that was Wendy Dwyer. And he said, well, uh, and tell me a little bit about her. And I said, Jim, all I know is she is wonderful. She is the epitome of this award, she deserves it, she needs to get it. Um, and you can imagine Jim, in his very pristine, serious manner, emailed me and said, well, I know you really want Wendy to, to get this award, but can you give me a little more detail about it? Um, is she a lawyer? Is she worked for the clerk's office, serves subpoenas, any ties, anything like that. And um, I know some of you are out there saying, what, has something changed? I mean, how is Wendy getting this award and had touched the legal system? Well, you're going to figure that out in a minute. But it was actually quite simple why I nominated Wendy. As lawyers, we are not just tasked to prosecute people accused of crimes, as Bruce's office does, or defend those accused of crimes, as our office does. We, as lawyers, as public defenders, state attorneys, whatever, um, position you hold, we have to not only do our jobs, but we have to do more. I firmly believe we have to believe in the human spirit and do something about that. And that is Wendy. <clears throat> the, the plaque um, she is going to receive tonight, although um, I confirmed with Jim in an email, of course he's denying it now, that the phrase on it was one that I had seen, which is to create a better word, world. Well, they've changed the verbiage on the plaque, so my whole theme has kind of gone to heck, but the, <laughs> the essence is there. We're creating a better world, and Wendy, no one does that better than Wendy. Let me give you some basic facts about Wendy. Now, this is the stuff that I was told to do. It's, you know, it's very impressive, it's wonderful, but this, this is not the reason Wendy is going to receive this award. She's a full-time professor at IRSC and writes weekly columns spotlighting events, volunteerism, and nonprofit activities for luminaries. She writes for several magazines, including Stewart Magazine. She's an award-winning writer and educator, and she was recently the recipient of the prestigious John and Sue Ann Roosh Excellence Award given by the League for Innovation in Colleges and the IRSC's President's Cabinet. <clears throat> now, although that's impressive, again, that's not why she is the recipient. Simply put, in legal terms, <laughs> she is wonderful. <laughs> she is wonderful. She single-handedly gives more to this community than anyone I know. And I don't have time to mention all the things she does or all the people sh she has touched, all the charities she has helped, all the behind the scenes things she does every single day. But I reached out, and with the help of Stacy Malinowski from Mustard Seed, <laughs> um, 
we talked to some people, some of the charities that she has touched and helped. Uh, because again, she is so everywhere helping people that I didn't even know where to start. But Stacy, thank you for helping me. And I just want to share with you some of the comments I got. I'm not going to read all the emails, just highlights. From Mustard Seed Ministries. Wendy has enriched the lives of others by demonstrating her passion and compassion for those around her, particularly students under her professorship. Wendy gives of her time and talents without asking anything in return. Wendy is truly an inspiration and a blessing to our organization. Oh, I'll read this too, this is kind of cute. Re recently, Wendy was con contacted regarding a client that was homeless and we helped her obtain temporary housing. And however, her dog couldn't stay with her. So what did Wendy and Dan, her one also wonderful husband, do? They open the door and I think they still have the dog at their house, so God bless you. From the Jazz and Blues Society, Wendy Dwyer's smile, energy, and intellect are apparent when one becomes involved in her world. Wendy Dwyer deserves any and all accolades bestowed upon her for her passionate display of caring and her effective positive thinking solutions for those who seek to help others without regard for her personal benefit. Sydney Liebman, Liebman from the Hands Clinic. What can I say about Wendy? I owe her so much for being the catalyst for the Julia Project to benefit the Hands Clinic of St. Lucie County. And I know many of uh, you in this room know about that. This, was, this very unique project is based upon the nonfiction book by Cheryl Jarvis entitled The Necklace. It has brought together 13 local women for two full years to raise awareness of services provided by and much needed funds for the Hands Clinic of St. Lucie County, a free health care clinic serving low income uninsured adult residents. As a result of this project and Wendy's hands on involvement, more than 300,000 has been raised to benefit the Hands Clinic of St. Lucie County and thousands of people across this county have been made aware of the services provided to the uninsured because of her. Inner Truth Project. Wendy has tirelessly led the Writing Down Your Journey Writers Workshop at the Inner Truth Project with her trusted sidekick, Dan, for over two years. She has volunteered her time and singularly grown the group into the fun, striving, and therapeutic monthly gathering that it is today. She has written countless grants for free and award applications for the center and offers her artistic photography to help empower those who have been victimized to see themselves through a new lens. Wendy Dwyer is one of the most amazing women I know. There are a small group of women I refer to as women of light, of which she is one. These are women who bring light into your life rather than sucking the life out of you. <laughs> she truly is one in a million and a tr woman I truly respect and admire. It is impossible for one paragraph to tell you how much we appreciate the talent and support the St. Lucie Community Theater Pineapple Playhouse has received from Wendy over the many years. Wendy has the kindest, most giving heart of anyone we've ever met. Being around our wonderful Wendy makes you want to be a better person. Oh yeah. She is a positive person in this sometimes negative world. My oldest daughter Alicia and I had just returned from a trip to Nicaragua and after checking on a new school in a very remote village in the Highlands, Alicia had raised the funds for its construction. We also decided to check out some of the other projects and after seeing what was happening, we were feeling disappointed by the way our women's group was being treated. The vital link of used bikes had been cut off. The women repaired the bikes and sold them as a means of supporting the center's Botex school. <clears throat> Once we were, uh, arrived home, we started telling Wendy about our findings and she decided we would collect and send the needed bikes ourselves, which we did. Wendy made this thing work she called our go core group of people wheels. Because of wheels of love, 
The center spread out to include 11 other centers, we were, and we were also able to hire a full-time doctor to staff this free clinic. <clears throat> the clinic and schools are still in operation, and we are planning a trip back this year. Wendy has the gift of bringing people together and creating a better world. A bundle of inspiration and imagination that she generously shares with the community. Heathcote Botanical Gardens. I'm telling you, I got a stack four times this big and I could go on and on. Not to mention um, the help that, the, that she has given Life Builders, um, the 501c3 we started about seven years ago um, and helped get it off the ground and is there with us ever since, or the pizza par party at the juvenile detention center that we, we do every Christmas Eve for the kids in the juvenile detention center. Again, I could go on and on and on. I think that Wendy, the way Wendy <clears throat> ends all of her emails, and many of you have received them, kind of su sums up her spirit. Never doubt that a small group of committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. I have another one. One person can make a difference, and everyone should try. She is the small group. She is the one person. She has brightened my life and so many others for so many years. She truly has made this world a better place. Wendy Dwyer. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, first of all, Bruce, I know I didn't have a chance to meet Lane, but I have to tell you, as someone who was a victim and had great access to the victim support unit a couple years ago, I am so, so grateful for all that she did. And I am so honored to be mentioned in the same breath as someone who, whose help gave me great comfort in a very difficult time, and thank you. But Diamond, I know you want to be like Bruce. <laughs> Someday I want to be like Diamond Liddy, don't we all? <laughs> um, thank you so much. I had, I would tell you that I was mad at Diamond about this, but she'll probably admit that I really was. I would tell you that I'm very surprised to see so many really kind faces here to support me. I truly am. Um, I will tell you that no one told me I had to say anything and I wouldn't have planned it. I will tell you that Stacy Malinowski, I will get you back. <laughs> <laughs> it's not over yet. Um, and my husband, I did not know you were such a good liar. I'm going to question everything from now on. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for giving me a chance to be here tonight, but more importantly, thank you for giving me a chance to be part of this wonderful community. Um, people like Linda, like Chris, like Stacy, like Greg, like Robin, like Marianne, all the people that are here to support me are people who jump in whenever I ask for something to, um, to help a charity in the community, and I could not be luckier than to be here in in this place with so many great people. And Diamond, would you mind if I ask for a copy of your notes so my dad will know I actually, <laughs> I actually have a job and, <laughs> finally, and, and do good things? <laughs> I will. Thank you so much. This has been um, 
a huge surprise. And Linda and Susie, I can't believe you didn't tell me. Thank you. <laughs> I know. They never understand. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Carlos Wells. I'm going to be hosting the art contest. We're all here uh, in addition to the honorees who were nominated earlier for uh, to honor the children who um, stepped up to the challenge and um, uh, presented a uh, a number of very high quality pieces of art for um, the community's benefit. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Troy Ingersoll, if you could step up here. Troy Ingersoll is going to introduce um, speaker Wayne Gent. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, friends of the library, for hosting this and recognizing our children at St. Lucie County and their artwork here. And, and thank you, parents, for coming out to support this this occasion. I'm uh, here to introduce Coach Gent, Assistant Principal Gent, uh, Principal Gent of uh, Westwood, uh, St. Lucie West. He started his education over 40 years ago when he was 15 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. No, 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 no. But he started his education uh, public service here over 40 years ago. He went off to uh, Palm Beach, uh, what is that, uh, Palm Beach County and started working there. And we stole him back uh, in July 1st, 2015. We needed someone that could put processes in place and systems in place. And Mr. Gent did that. And uh, from there we went from, four, from 45th to 13th in the state of Florida in the graduation rate. We raised our graduation rate to 86.8. .8. That's almost 11% increase. And that's just because of his work that he's done through our teachers, our many teachers in support of professionals that we have in St. Lucie County. So please welcome Mr. Wayne Gent. Thank you, Coach. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ingersoll, for the, for the welcome. And uh, my comments will be very, very brief because uh, the students, um, our attention span is our age. And uh, so I know our students have been here for a long time, and uh, they're ready to get back uh, home, get a good night's sleep, and because uh, we've still got a month of school left. But um, I want to thank Jim and, and his team for uh, this partnership with the school district and an opportunity uh, for our students to showcase uh, their talents. And one of the things that's very concerning to me in our country is the lack of civic knowledge and um, how our students and our society seems to have forgotten what got us to this point and the freedoms that our soldiers preserve and, and what we try to do in public education every day, which is really not the weak link, but the strongest link. We take every child that comes in the door, no matter skin color, no matter what country they come from. If you come into this country tonight, you can enroll in our schools tomorrow and we're gonna give you a quality education. And it's uh, really been the genius public education of, uh, of American democracy and the link that holds us together. And so I'm very, very proud to represent this school district and our best days are ahead of us. So, I'm gonna ask Kim to come up, and we're gonna give out the awards to our students, but I know that uh, I did a little research as well on the, on the amendment, and uh, one of my favorite movies is Lincoln, and that's been on Showtime for the last, uh, probably the last month or so, but I remember seeing it when it came to the theaters, and it talks about the back, behind the scenes deals that was done for the 13th Amendment, uh, that's, which then led, and as was mentioned before, which kind of led then to the 14th Amendment, and then a lot of the freedoms that we uh, enjoy today in public education where we got away from separate but equal and uh, different uh, historic landmarks that came from this amendment and paved the way. So for the students, it's a chance to showcase their artwork, showcase their creativity, as well as learn, probably just as important, to learn about our nation, to learn about our history, and to learn that this is something that can't be, for can't be taken for granted and something that we need to continue to infuse in our students each and every day. So to the parents that are here, thank you as well for giving the greatest gift, and that's the gift of time. Continue to be the president of your child's fan club. And um, even though they don't want you around when they get a little older in high school, hang in there. And then they maybe want to come back after college and live with you for a couple of years um, as well. So without further ado, we're going to uh, read some of the names. 
before we get to the names, the Friends of Rupert Smith did want to give uh, uh, Mr. Gent uh, um, a little gift. It's very customary. I think it's very appropriate, especially uh, given the affiliation with the Law Library, that we give books to a lot of our presenters. This book is called The Jury Returns by Louis Neiser. The actual copy you're going to be getting is a first printing signed uh, by the author, uh, and it's inscribed to John Swearington. He's one of the most powerful oil executives of his generation uh, as an industry uh, chairman of the board of Standard Oil, uh, Indiana. Um, this book is a riveting um, collection of um, some legal uh, stories, and um, the friends of Rupert J. Smith uh, proudly present you with the jury returns. Thank you. Very good. I appreciate that. Now I have my summer reading. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah, I'm going to have the uh, students to stay up here. So students, when you come up, you're going to stay up here. We're going to get you a nice line going, and then I'm sure there'll be a couple of photographs afterwards. So we'll do our 2017 winners, first of all, in our elementary category. And this is kindergarten through the second grade. And uh, I'm going to do my best to pronounce your names correctly. And uh, from Palm Point, Third place, $50, is Elena Bergella. Is Elena here? <laughs> Elena's in the second grade. Second place, $75, Palm Point, Dakota, Bornacor, Dakota, Bornacor, I got it. Dakota's in the first grade. And first place, $100 from Palm Point. Michael Pinaccio. Is Michael here? Here he comes. Here comes Michael, and Michael is also in the first grade. Now in our elementary school category, we'll go through grades three through five. Third place, $75. From Palm Point, Palm Point's walking away with everything tonight. Uh, Lupita Vargas, Lupita Vargas. <laughs> Lupita is in the fifth grade. Correct? You ready for middle school? You don't want to stay in elementary? <laughs> Ready for middle school. Second place, $100 from Palm Point. Nico Tovar. <laughs> Nico is also in the fifth grade. You ready for middle school? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> Very good. Congratulations. First place, a prize of $150. Palm Point. Kennedy Bird. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah. She's in the fourth grade. You ready for fifth grade? Yeah. Okay, very good. At our middle school, third place with $100. From Palm Point, Eric Hernandez. Eric Hernandez. Very good. Here comes Eric. <laughs> Eric is in the sixth grade. Second place, $150. From all right, a different school, Lincoln Park Academy, home of the great Greyhounds, Christian McCain. Christian McCain. <laughs> Christian
Christian is in the eighth grade. I know the answer to my question. <laughs> yes, right? Ready for high school? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, okay. All right. And in first place with the $200 award from Lincoln Park Academy, Animish Saha. Ask him if he was ready for high school. He said, I think so. <laughs> you have no choice. <laughs> and then speaking of high school, we'll move to high school. Our winners, third place, $200 from Lincoln Park Academy. Nadia Dimitrov. Nadia? Nadia here this morning, this evening? Okay. Our principal is here, so we'll make sure that uh, he gets that. I'll take the check. We'll make sure we get that to her. Second place, $300 prize, Isabella Marino in the ninth grade. Isabella. And our first place winner with a prize of $500. A senior, Amanda Fishbean. <laughs> Amanda is going to attend Indian River State College and she wants to be an art teacher. And uh, we have a program called A Promise is a Promise. So any of our seniors or any students that go away to college to be teachers uh, and major and graduate, they have a job waiting for them right back at the St. Lucie County Schools, guaranteed. So Amanda, your future is set. Okay. So we're gonna take a picture of everybody or in different groups? Everybody. Everybody, so come on down. Don't move, don't move. By grades? Okay. Yes, but we can make a group shot. There we go. Everybody can move down. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to conclude the. Uh, contest. We're going to have some pictures taken. Um, feel free to stick around and have some pictures taken with the contestants, the winners, the, uh, um, our honorees and our guests today. Thank you very much for attending. I want to thank uh, Kim Kunzo for uh, doing an awful lot of behind the scenes work. All of these pieces of artwork, over 300, had to be reviewed and judged. And uh, Kim did a fantastic job and uh, kind of quiet behind the scenes. Um, I'd like to thank um, the, uh, Carmela in the back who assisted us with the food and the preparations and all the refreshments um, and the uh, staff from the law library that assisted with um, uh, seeing that tonight was all set up and a success and I want to thank every one of you for attending. Without your participation we wouldn't have this event and I wanted to thank everyone for attending. Have a great evening. Thank you.